This Bible question is an excerpt from our television program, What Do the Scriptures Say? We hope that it will enrich your spiritual life, and we hope that you'll come back to www.scripturesay.com to find answers to your Bible questions. Thank you. In previous episodes, we talked about uh, the fact that Jesus explains just two of his parables. This is the second parable in Matthew chapter 13 that he explains. Let's read it. Jesus presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore again, then the tares became evident also. The slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, for while you were gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them, allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather up tares and bind them in bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Okay, again, we have the familiarity of the seed and the sower and this agrarian kind of setting that would have been very familiar to the first century Christians, to the first century church, to anyone living in Palestine in the first century. This is an image out of their backyard. They could see this very clearly. They've seen this a thousand times. And Jesus uses that earthly story then to teach a truth about the kingdom of heaven. In the New Testament, as I mentioned before, that the term kingdom of heaven is used to refer to a number of things. It's always, there's always a sense in which the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God refers to God's rule. It may specifically refer to the church with, under, which, oh, uh, under which people submit to God's rule. It can also have reference to the world in which we live in. This is God's world. This is our Father's world, as the song we sing says. And God is the creator. And so in that sense, he is, uh, this is his kingdom, the entire world. And, and that is the sense in which this parable makes the application. Here is the explanation that Jesus gives of this parable, beginning in verse 36. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and the disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And he said, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man, and the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so it shall be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness." and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, and the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who was, he who has ears, let him hear. As we have mentioned, this is just now then the second parable that Jesus gives an explanation to. The story of the farmer who sows good seed and who has an enemy who sows bad seed. And what's important for us to know uh, in this parable is that um, the tares, scholars tell us, were probably what uh, biologists refer to as the bearded darnel. Now, as I understand it, the bearded darnel is a weed that grows up and grew in Palestine that initially mimics uh, what a uh, what wheat looked like. Wheat was a was uh, one of the most important crops 
uh, around the world for, for many centuries. And in the first century, it was the most important crop that you could grow in, in Palestine. And this bearded darnel was a weed that looked exactly like wheat when they first started to grow. In fact, you couldn't tell the difference. That's why it would have been, a, would have been an inappropriate to go out and try to pull up the weeds because you couldn't tell the difference between what was genuinely wheat and what was the bearded darnel. We don't have to speculate about what all of that means in this parable because Jesus himself gives us the interpretation. He says that the field is the world and the sower of the good seed is the son of man and the sower of the tares is the devil and the good seed are the sons of the kingdom and the bad seed are the sons of the evil one and the reapers are the angels and the harvest ha comes at the end of the world. Now despite the fact that Jesus makes this very clear in the interpretation there's been a lot of speculation about what this parable means. It's interesting, again, to me that people will read an interpretation that comes from the lips of Jesus himself by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and will question how it is to be applied. Because the term kingdom is used in the New Testament in a variety of senses, this, this uh, confuses some people when they come to this context because they always want to make the kingdom mean the church or God's rule. And in this place, it simply means the world. This is God's kingdom. This world is God king, God's kingdom. Jesus says that the field in which the seed is sown is the world. Now, you see, the reason some become confused is because if the seed is sown in the kingdom and the kingdom refers to the church, then there's both good seed and bad seed in the church, and we're not supposed to do anything about that until the second coming when God will sort all of that out. Therefore, some people say we shouldn't engage in church discipline of any kind. We shouldn't try to determine who is genuine and who is not. God's going to do that. Well, that's not what this parable teaches, clearly, from what Jesus, Jesus' own application. The field in which the seed is sown is the world. In the world, there is sown both good seed and bad seed. And that is very clearly the point of this parable. The son of man sows good seed. The evil one sows bad seed. In the world that we live in, it is sometimes impossible for man to tell the difference. In fact, that's one of the tools that Satan uses to delude people. You get people like James Cameron who comes along and sows the seed of the evil one and he looks so pious and he looks so concerned. He looks so right. It's hard to tell the difference between him and the good seed, you see. You see how all of this uh, uh, falls into place. In the religious world, there are all kinds of people claiming to be Christians, good people, doing good things, who are the seed of the evil one, because Satan is the source of the tares. And Jesus explains that it is the devil who sowed those seeds. It's the evil one who sowed those seeds. And it may be impossible for some to be able to tell the difference. Remember in last episode, we had reference to Paul writing to the church of Thessalonica, and he said, or, uh, he, he said to them that they would be deceived if they did not receive a love of the truth. If, if your first priority is not to love what the Word of God says, you're open to deception. There will come a time when God will judge the good and the bad. And the harvest will come and the two seeds, the two plants will be separated. This is really a parable about man's inability oftentimes to be able to sort those things out properly. God is the one who judges properly. We sometimes can't tell the difference, but God will tell the difference. And there's something else that's interesting in this parable. Uh, I hear today... A lot about um, a lot of people saying that uh, Jesus never really believed in 
in hell or eternity or eternal punishment, but that's certainly not the case in this parable, is it? Jesus said that uh, when, when he and his angels come to judge the world, God is going to throw the evil into the f furnace of fire. It'll be a place of gnashing of, of the gnashing of teeth. The good seed will be rewarded. They will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of the Father. For all eternity, Jesus believed in heaven and in hell. And the difference in the harvest will be the result of the seed that is sown. I want to talk to you about that when we come back in just a minute. Life is in the seed. It's true in nature and it's true in the spirit realm. Human life comes into reality when the seed becomes fertile and grows into a human being. In nature, seeds are necessary to grow plants. What's fascinating about that truth and that the life is in the seed is uh, what occasionally we run across in, in the natural world that uh, uh, is, is absolutely amazing. In um, World War II, in the horrible bombing of London, the Natural History Museum in London was destroyed by fire. It was burned to the ground. In that Natural History Museum, there were some 1,200-year-old 12, uh, seeds from an ancient Chinese uh, lotus tree. And after that fire, and after that museum was completely destroyed, remarkably, those seeds began to sprout and to germinate. Imagine seeds 1,200 years old germinating and bringing forth plant. Remarkable. Because the life is in the seed. That's the way that God arranged the world that we live in. And the seed can lie dormant for years. In the case of the lotus seed in London, 1,200 years. But let me take it another step forward. In the, in, in the year uh, 1970, I believe it was, or 1973, during, it was 1973, during the archaeological excavations at Masada in Palestine. Masada was the fortress that was built by King Herod on the shores of the Dead Sea. In excavating Masada, uh, archaeologists found some date seeds that were 2,000 years old. They were uh, amazed at their condition. There were a lot of seeds found there, a lot of foodstuffs found there that were decayed and, and uh, were, had deteriorated. But they were, scientists were especially excited about the condition of, of three date seeds uh, that they found that they considered to be in pristine condition. Now, what was so interesting about this is that for many centuries, the dates that at one time existed in the land of Palestine had, had become extinct. And, and in the first century and for previous to that, dates in Palestine were really a food staple. They were, they were at the heart of the diet of the average person who lived in Palestine. And, and scientists had always wondered uh, about their nutritional value and what special properties they might possess and that kind of thing. So when these seeds were found at Masada, they were excited about the pot potential and possibility of germination. It wasn't until 2005 that they actually decided in a very controlled experiment to take these 2,000-year-old date seeds and try to germinate them. And they took these three seeds, and in a very controlled environment, they did their best to get them to germinate, and remarkably, one of them, one of them sprouted. One of them began to grow, a date plant, a date tree. Think about that. 2,000 years ago, 
someone in that fortress at Masada put away some seeds, maybe to be sown that very next spring to provide dates. And then in the destruction of Masada, they were lost for 2,000 years. And today, in a scientist's controlled environment, that seed is growing dates. It's not growing apples. It's not growing oranges. It's not growing apricots or avocados. It's, it's growing dates. Because the seed that is sown, even if it's 2,000 years old, will reproduce after its kind. What the parable of the tares tells us is seed reproduces after its kind. The good seed, which the Son of Man sows, produces Christians, genuine New Testament Christians. The seed that is sown by the evil one produces evil sons of the devil. It's often difficult to tell the difference between the two because as Paul wrote to the Corinthians, even Satan himself disguises himself as an angel of light. In the world that we live in, if you're not terribly perceptive based upon your familiarity with the Word of God, you might be deceived into believing that a child of the devil is the child of God because the seed that was sown will only reproduce after its kind. What these first two parables illustrate for us and emphasize for us is the extreme importance of the relationship that the church has to sowing the seed of the kingdom, which is the Word of God, and the Word of God only, because seeds reproduce after their kind. We don't sow the seed of men's doctrine. We don't see, sow the seed of men's concepts, men's ideas, men's religious organizations. Those are the seeds of the evil one when they take one away from Christ. The seed of the kingdom is the Word of God. And when that seed is sown today, even 2,000 years later, that seed reproduces sons of the kingdom, genuine New Testament Christians. We'll look at the next parable in Matthew 13 when we come back in just a minute. By the way, if you want to go, uh, if you want to go out on the internet and look up uh, uh, information on that seed that was found at Mas Masada, that is uh, that grew, um, you can uh, enter. Uh, go to Google and enter sprouting Methuselah. That's what they call that plant. It's very interesting information. Well, next we talk about a seed. Isn't it amazing? Look at the first two parables that Jesus teaches are about seeds, and, and he explains them. This, the next one in Matthew, is about the mustard seed, and there's no explanation here, but what, we're, what we should be able to do after having had the explanation in the first two is to make the proper application. Let's read it together. He presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all other seeds, but when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. The first two parables that Jesus taught are explained. And it's easy to surmise that the disciples may have been discouraged when they heard the parable of the sowers. They may have been discouraged to think that a lot of their sowing would go for naught. And when they heard the parable of the weed and the tares, they may have similarly said, you know, look at, you know, only one out of four seeds that is sown is going to bring forth a harvest, and there's going to be a lot of tares in the field. And so it's, it seems likely to me that the next two parables that Jesus teaches are an effort to help give them some encouragement not to judge too quickly uh, what the results of the harvest are going to be because some seeds never come to fruition. The parable of the mustard seed helps to do that, and the parable of the leaven that we will look at uh, next week are, are two that, uh, that really help to encourage us 
in the way that the seed will continue to, to, uh, to grow and to bring forth a harvest. The mustard seed itself was well known in Palestine for it was a favorite plant in gardens because it uh, brought some spice to life. It was hot mustard. Uh, some of the critics will look at this particular passage and say the mustard seed's not the smallest seed in the world. The Bible's all wrong about that. Well, it's true. There are seeds that are smaller than mustard seeds. Mustard seeds are, are very, very small. And in Palestine, generally, uh, of all of the seeds that were used by the average person, this was the smallest of all of the seeds. And it produced the greatest plant. So the smallest seed in the average garden produced the greatest plant. That's what you're supposed to see here. You're, uh, some people want to come to the Bible and say, oh, he, he made a biological error here. Well, now you missed the point of the story. The average person growing a garden was going to have all kinds of seeds, and the smallest one in that kind of setting would be the mustard seed. But it would grow a plant by the time it was through growing. It would be... 10, sometimes 15 feet tall. It was not a tree. Again, Jesus is not making a biological statement here saying that mustard seeds develop mustard trees. There is no such thing as a mustard tree. It's that it grew to be like a tree and it often provided shelter. It's frequently the mustard seed used to describe anything that has a small beginning that grows into something that is big. And Jesus used it in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, to describe someone's faith. Um, uh, let me look at that verse again, verse 31. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. And it's smaller than all the other seeds, but when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. The point of this parable is clearly that the kingdom and the seed would have a small beginning and grow into something that was very large. Old Testament prophecy helps us to see this in Isaiah chapter 1, uh, in Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, the Messiah comes into this world not in, a, in grandeur of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but as a, a humble person would come into this world. He was born in humble circumstances very um, small beginning, but had a huge influence. Concerning the kingdom of God in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 35, a, a stone, a small stone would bring down the kingdoms of the world. And that small stone would grow into a huge influential mountain. The son of God grew up in a in a desolate province in a remote place of the world. He didn't appear in public life until his 13th year. He taught for two or three years in neighboring villages in a remote part of the world, occasionally going to Jerusalem. He makes a few converts, chiefly among those who are unlearned and the poor. He falls into the hands of his enemies. He dies a shameful death on the cross. He has such a slight and small beginning, and yet his kingdom grows into something that to this day has tremendous impact all around the world. Just as that small stone in Daniel 2 and verse 35 becomes a whole mountain that fills the world. The kingdom begins in a small way. If you understand the kingdom in this parable to have reference to the church, you apply it properly. And you see that when the kingdom started in the first century, there were just a few disciples. There were 120 disciples, Acts 2 verse 41 tells us. And then that, that group of disciples grew in one day to 3,000. By the time Acts 4.4 4 records what's going on in the church, there are about 5,000. And then that kingdom spreads throughout Judea and, uh, and Samaria all over the world. 
Next week when we get back together, we'll talk about this mustard seed kingdom that is to this day influencing the world that we live in. But this was to encourage the disciples, though the beginning may be small, it's going to have tremendous influence. Tune in next week where we continue to study the parables of Christ, and we'll see you then. Bye-bye. We thank you for your interest in what do the scriptures say. We hope that you will come back to scripturesay.com often for answers to your Bible questions. See you then.